How to adapt D&D for young children today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about running the ultimate game of Dungeons and Dragons. You can level up your game by subscribing and click the bell icon for future notifications, and you'll be on your way to adventure. A high level bard once sang, I believe the children are the future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. My children have been dressing up like orcs and princesses ever since they could walk, and they've been playing role playing games ever since they could understand that an eight sided die was not candy. Here are pictures of my children from the Gen Con 2009 catalog. They're all in there. Here's a shot of my youngest son DMing at Gen Con. I think he's about seven or eight in this picture. Probably the youngest dungeon master to ever be there. One of the first ways I introduced him to the game was to create a spelling dungeon. I would set up the little models and then I'd take his list of spelling words and quiz him. For every word he got correct, he'd kill a monster. If he missed a word, he would lose one of his three hit points. And if he died, he had to start all over again. Recently I was at Gen Con with my family and I noticed very few children playing RPGs. Most RPG events are for children 13 and up. There was virtually nothing for children under 10 and I, I think that's a real shame. I strongly believe children are the future of this hobby. If we want tabletop RPGs to continue to grow and thrive and expand, we have to involve children as young as possible. This video is going to focus on running role-playing games for children between the ages of 5 and 10, although some of the techniques I'm going to give you, they can also be used with preteens and teenagers as well. And my main focus is going to be accessibility and removing barriers to entry. So the first barrier to entry is literacy. So this is my simplified character sheet where I try to eliminate as many words as possible. We have player name, character name, and then character type. In this case, she wanted to play a princess wizard, so I allowed her to. I don't think the children should be constrained by like predetermined classes. Just ask them what they want to be and go with it. After level, I try to use icons as much as possible. The ribbon represents experience points, it's rewards. The coins represent money. Armor class is represented by a shield. Every character has five hit points. I use smiley faces to convey the health of the character. When a monster hits, the character gets one level sadder, allowing the child to keep track of their own hit points without having to know how to count. I compress the ability scores into three stats. The muscle represents strength and constitution, the brain, intelligence and wisdom, and the lightning bolt speed, dexterity. I don't include charisma because it's beyond a child's understanding and they're not going to be using it for the simple dungeon crawls we're going to play. I don't include derivative ability scores like the 3 to 18 numbers, instead I just give the bonuses. The standard array is plus 3, plus 1, and 0. I've used this character sheet with struggling readers, children with dyslexia, and English language learners. I met with a lot of success. And now let's approach the next barrier, mathematics. We're going to roll 46 and drop the lowest. 8. 16. 11. That doesn't even take a second. It takes about two tenths of a second for me to interpret those pips as numbers and add them all together. But a six or seven year old is used to adding numbers like this in a column. Even counting the pips would be effortful. Here's another thing we take for granted, rolling to hit. Adding a plus three strength bonus to an 18 is a major calculation. If you're five or six years old, it might require using your fingers. The way to remove this barrier is simple. You're going to do all the mathematical calculations for the child. If the orc's armor class is 14 and the fighter has a plus three strength, just tell the child to roll an 11. 15. She hits. I eliminate rolling for damage by having each successful blow score a single hit point of damage. Natural 20 scores 2. Low-level monsters like goblins, skeletons, and orcs only have a single hit point. A large monster like an ogre might have 3 to 5. This limits the dice you need to just a d20 and greatly speeds up the game. And this is good because children have short attention spans. For magic, I really recommend the Tracy Hickman's Extreme Dungeon Mastery Method, which is you ask the child, okay, what kind of magical effect do you want to create? Then you think about it, you assign a difficulty rating and have the child roll that or better on a 20-sided die. And if they can do it, the spell happens the way the child wants. I had a child once that wanted to make a rainbow sword, so I said, okay, roll a 10, you got a rainbow sword for, you know, D6 rounds. Be prepared. One concept they really like is freezing things. I guess because they've seen it a lot in, in cartoons, people being frozen in ice cubes. Something like that, just make it work like a sleep spell. And I wouldn't limit them with spell slots either. I'd let the wizard cast unlimited spells. You want the wizards to be as powerful as any other characters in the game. 
kids can get pretty loud. That's one of the main barriers, I think, to, to playing with a bunch of children. So I'm going to give you a technique, a teacher technique, that will help get that under control. At the start of the game, you're going to tell them the number one rule of Dungeons & Dragons is you have to listen to the Dungeon Master, especially when the Dungeon Master counts off 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. At that point, everyone's got to be quiet and everyone's got to pay attention. Now, when you get a bunch of kids together, they get really excited and they get really loud. So don't be surprised if you have to do this a number of times during the course of the session. That's okay, do it as many times as you need and never talk over children. Always wait until they're quiet and they're paying attention before you give a description or tell them what's going on. I highly recommend using miniatures and terrain if you have them. Children in the five to 10 range are naturally tactile and putting something in the center of the table gives them something to focus on. You don't have to go nuts, just a few key pieces like a door or a chest. I also really recommend using pre-painted minis, even if they're a little expensive, because their swords bend. WizKids minis are also flexible. Also, these have been sealed with lacquer, which will protect them from Dorito fingers. Miniatures are also great for giving kids inspiration so that they could kind of pick what they want to play. They may have a preconceived idea, like I want to be an archer, or I want to be a princess, in which case go with that. But if they're not really sure, I like to show them a wide range of figures in terms of classes, fantasy races, gender, and ethnicities. That way, they can better imagine themselves as the character, or play something totally different from themselves, which is totally cool too. As far as plot goes, put them in the dungeon right away. It's called Dungeons and Dragons. That's what they're looking for. Don't try to have any kind of social encounters or have them going to a town first to find out why they're going into the dungeon. A child of six, seven, or eight doesn't need to know why they're in the dungeon. Just put them there. I cap a typical session for children at about 90 minutes. That is about the extent of their attention span, and it's about going to be the extent of your patience. By that point, you may need some Excedrin. That works out to about five encounters. Of those, one should be exploratory, one should be a puzzle or a riddle, generally kids like riddles, and the other three should be combat. As with adult games, I think it's always better to let the game be too short and let people want more than to have it go on too long and then they start getting bored. Also, let them make their own mistakes and learn from them. Like, don't tell them they shouldn't split the party. Let them split the party and see what happens. A friend of mine once had me run D&D for her child's, I think it was 12th or 13th birthday party, and he had a few of his friends, and in the second room they split the party and it ended in a total party kill. Yes, I killed a 12-year-old and all his friends on his birthday. So what did we do? I said, you're your first character's son, and it's 10 years later, and you've grown up, and you've always wondered what happened to your father, so you've gone off to explore the same dungeon where he was last seen. And they had a lot of fun discovering their father's skeletons in rusted armor. Parents tend to think their children are really fragile, and they're going to be traumatized by their character dying, but that's not true. They're very resilient, and especially if you say at the beginning of the session, look, your character might die, and if that happens, you're going to be a brand new character, exactly like your old character, and you're going to appear in the next room. They're generally cool with it. Finally, if you do go to conventions, consider designing an event just for children. Years ago, I saw an event at a convention. It was superhero theme, and the, and the, the children got to play the superheroes, and the parents got to play the sidekicks. And I thought, wow, that's brilliant. I could do that with D&D. I can have the, the kids play the wizards and the fighters and barbarians and stuff, and their parents can be their henchmen. This is a great bonding experience for the child and the parent. The child gets the excitement of having more power than their parent, but at the same time, the parent can still be there next to the child to help them read the dice and work the character sheet. So kids have fun, the parents have fun. It's a win-win all around. It only has to be, say, 90 minutes or a two-hour slot. The best time to run it is something like a 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning or 12 noon on a Saturday. Remember, children have earlier bedtimes. If more people took the time to do this, it would go a long way toward bringing children into our hobby. And Hasbro, free tip if anybody is watching this, you already have Monopoly Junior. Why don't you have D&D Junior? You could have simple rules, a dozen miniatures, a few dungeon floor tiles on cardstock, and you would introduce new players to the game and create a billion dollar revenue stream. D&D's main consumer is between 30 and 50 years old. They have a lot of kids. Do it. Because if Paizo sees this video first, they definitely will. 
Now, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share. Questions or comments, did I miss anything? Put them below. Also included in the links is a great organization called The Hero's Journey, and it provides dungeon masters for young children in libraries and churches. If you live in New Jersey, you can help volunteer your time and bring the joy of role-playing games to a new generation of players. Or you can donate money. It's a charity. It's tax-deductible, and I don't get any money from it. I'm just a volunteer, so you're not giving anything to me. If you want more tips on being a better dungeon master, check out these videos over here. Once again, I'm Professor Dungeon Master for Dungeon Craft. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you at the table, and may all your rolls be 20s.